Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. This episode is brought to you by the best-selling online course, Become a Super Learner. If you're like most people, you probably have a long list of books you want to read, languages you wish you knew, and skills you wish you had the time to learn. This course teaches you how to learn anything and everything faster and more effectively by teaching you not only speed reading, but also an entirely new framework for understanding, creating, and storing memories. To get an 80% off coupon and join over 25,000 satisfied students, visit jle.vi slash learn. That's http colon slash slash jle dot vi forward slash learn. Hola, super friends. Welcome to this week's show. My guest today is probably best described as a third culture kid using his difference to make a difference. Growing up on four different continents, he's been able to bring a unique perspective and inspirational story that empowers people to make a difference in this world. I love it. Through his company, UID Media, and his podcast, As Told by Nomads, he inspires people to live alternative lifestyles and use their own special skills and advantages to get the most out of their lives. I recently was a guest on his show, and I absolutely enjoyed the chance to pick his brain and talk with him about it. In short, he's an all-around cross-culturalism and inspiration expert, and we love that stuff here at Becoming Superhuman. He's also an avid writer and blogger, and in fact, you may have read about him or read some of his work on the Huffington Post or entrepreneur.com. You might have even heard of his book, The Ultimate Guide to TCK Living. In any case, in this episode, we talk about this crazy, beautiful, and increasingly multicultural world that we live in and how to stake your claim and shine in it. We also go into some great stuff about life purpose and entrepreneurship. It's overall a lighter, easier, and more entertaining listen than some of the more intense and geeky human optimization stuff we've discussed on the show recently, but it's definitely no less valuable or worthwhile. So without further ado, I'd like to present to you guys, Mr. Tayo Roxon. Greetings, Mr. Tayo. How are you doing, my friend? I am good. Good. Fantastic. Awesome. Hey, I had a chance to listen to the show where I was on your show. I think it was yesterday, day before yesterday. It turned out amazing, man. Hey, well, I mean, that was because of you. You did it. Nah, you're a fantastic host. I really appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> it was a blast. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. How's Israel? Fantastic. Super hot, though, right now. It's absolutely scorching today. And, you know, of course, I got stuck, like, running around the city. I had to ship out a bunch of kind of hand-signed copies to some of my students. So I'm stuck sitting in the post office. Nobody's happy being there, you know, but trying to stay positive. <laughs> trying to smile at people. <laughs> That's on its way to be a bestseller. Yours is already a bestseller. You had an Amazon bestseller. It's a bestseller in memory and study skills. It just dropped to number four. It was at number one for a little while. So, you know, for anyone listening, hint, hint. <laughs> Get back. Get it yeah. back up. Get it back up there. Buy 20 copies if you have to. Do what you have to do, you know? <laughs> so, Tayo, for those who aren't familiar, I know you and I have spoken at length before, but maybe tell us a bit about your background and brought you to where you are today, kind of kicking ass with the podcast and the media company and interviewing all kinds of weirdos like me on your show. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I'm definitely a weirdo myself. So, <laughs> rock on. <laughs> My story is I grew up as a diplomatic kid, so I ended up growing up in four different continents and five different countries. And throughout my experience, it was always one interesting experience after another where I would go on and move and then I would try and find myself. And I remember during my you know adolescent years and my um, formative years, I was discovering who I was, but I was also going through puberty, so you can imagine that. <laughs> Throughout that process, I think by the time I was 17, I really had come to realize that I was fine being who I was, 
right? It was really okay to be me. Oh, man, and that's that, early. I'm, I'm yeah. still figuring that one out, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it, it was 17 where I was comfortable with that. So I then became, you know, okay with expressing myself because I was like, you know, it's okay to be different. And then fast forward to about uh, a year and a half ago, I went to an Ariana Huffington event and she had been talking about how her accent was something that she had at one point wanted to change. And people were like, no, this is what makes you you. And she was saying it as a joke, you know, it was just part of her a book tour thing. And it stuck with me for some reason. I, I Right there, I remember picking out a pen and paper and saying, I'm going to reach out to a bunch of people that look like they're not supposed to sound and sound like they're not supposed to look. That's, you know, essentially what I was. Mm. And, you know, some of these people, a lot of them are third culture kids. And third culture kids are people who spend the formative periods of their lives outside of their parents' cultures. So it's, you know, diplomatic kids, global nomads, whatever, missionary kids, people who just end up having their culture, their parents' cultures, and the mixture of all the other cultures they've interacted with. So I went on this ambitious project to say I was going to create a podcast without knowing actually how to do so. So I went on Twitter, found out a bunch of third culture kids using the hashtag third culture kids or hashtag TCKs. That's the acronym. And it- I reached out to them and said, hey, I'm going to start a podcast. I want to be able to tell you a story because I think we're well equipped to be global leaders. And it was just as simple as that. I wasn't really expecting a lot of yeses, but then I got about 70 yeses. And this is the first time I'd ever gotten more yeses than no's than anything. So then I knew I had to create a podcast. Without <laughs> so I got on it and I started relearning how to do that. And podcast started to pick up. And then I, I realized that I had something here. And then... My mission statement was born about maybe six months after that, which was you came use your difference to make a difference. And I said, you know what? I'm going to start doing this as a side hustle while I was, you know, working while I got my MBA. And then all of a sudden in the startup, I was working and new management came in. And then she called me into the office and I thought it was just for like a routine checkup. And she basically fired me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because you had the side hustle? No, it was just a new management, new marketing manager. She just had a team she already wanted to work with. And I remember just staring. It was like the movies. You look at someone and you can't hear anything anymore. <laughs> I was looking at her. I was, remember I was trying to don't freak out. Don't walk out. Don't slam the door. I was like, uh, uh. And for that, I just kept breathing. I was like saying all the right things. Like, yeah, you know, I understand. You got your team. You got your team. I walked to my table. They had already logged me out. And I remember feeling like, all right. Okay. All right. You guys, okay, I'm going to show you. So I went home and I spent like maybe a day thinking, gosh, what's wrong with me? I beat myself down and I said, I'm not going to let this happen to me. And I'm going to channel my energy into building the company that I was on my side house already. So I I spent the whole weekend, build out the website. And then I now made another ambitious goal and said, I'm going to have content every day. Screw you, company. Wow. (laughs) And then I didn't know how I was going to do that either. But now I, I have content every day. But the amazing premise of the platform is UID, use your difference to make a difference. And it's a platform for millennials and a resource for cross-cultural kids across the world. Amazing. And for those of you guys listening who might have some kind of fantasy that these episodes you know, are magical and you spend an hour recording them and you just toss it up on the internet, it doesn't work like that. Like There's a lot of work that goes into each one of these episodes and a lot of research and a lot of you know, a lot of back conversations to make this conversation happen, a lot of editing to make all the guests sound, uh, you know, completely composed and perfect and wonderful. So, you know, in Hebrew, we say, Kola kavod, like all the respect to you for doing out a daily show to inspire people every single day. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I mean, you know, people like John Lee Thomas who do the daily show. I don't even understand how that happens. Yeah. Because just producing the daily content with the articles and all that and then being like editor in chief and publisher, I'm like, oh, yeah. I can't imagine what a podcast is. John is a beast. Like, yeah, I'm scheduled to be on his show. He's scheduled to be on my show. But when I say that, he books three months in advance, oh which means, God. you know, he's got 90 people ahead of me who are going to appear on the show and probably, you know, 30 or 40 appearances of shows he needs to be on. But totally down to earth, humble guy. Just amazing. Yeah. I've had him on the show. He's a good guy. Absolutely. All right. So you're doing a daily show for quite some time now. What are some of the most powerful lessons you've learned in your travels or speaking to these TCKs? Well, with the TCKs, the thing that's is interesting is throughout this process, I've learned what I call the DBCs. I formed on my uh, DBCs of making a global, of global impact in the world. And the thing is, as a TCK, you have to learn how to defeat the supposed to syndrome. That's the D. Yeah. yeah. B is to break down the Berlin walls. 
that exists in today's society and then cease to connect in a digital age. I'm going to talk about this later on in the year, but you guys, your audience is getting a preview of this. Oh, cool. So when I say defeating the supposal syndrome, what is the supposal syndrome? The supposal syndrome is the idea that you're supposed to be a certain way because a certain culture tells you that's how you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when TCK is coming to another country or anyone really goes to another culture, you find that there are already some paradigms that exist and then... What what happens is when you're trying to fit in, it's because you're trying to adjust to those paradigms. And then it's either a very bad journey because you realize you can't be that. And then you get more frustrated and then you start acting out of character or you become something else that's so far from what you're supposed to be. And then you end up not being actually who you're supposed to be. So what happens with TCKs is that they don't learn how to defeat that. It's very detrimental and it limits them from the potential of who they could be. Now, breaking out the Berlin Walls exists today. During the height of the Cold War, we have the East Germany and West Germany separated by the Berlin Wall. It was paranoia, Soviet Union, United States, was going to throw out the first bomb, bam, communist and, you know, uh, democracy. But it was my way and in their way. Now, the Berlin Wall that exists today manifests themselves in many things, stereotypes, bullying, you know, and all these kind of isms and that type of thing. But what happens is if you have stereotypes, you cloud your judgment and then you just you don't even give yourself a chance to understand what happens when you collaborate with people that are different, which is you learn how to work with crisis management, foster innovation and empathy. So you miss out on those three things because you've already put up a, a wall that's already in there. And stereotypes to me are the laziest ways of understanding culture because they make assumptions about who you are and what you do without actually knowing who you are and what you do. So. When you start doing all this, the magical Berlin walls exist and then they just somehow manifest in ways. And whether you're hiring people and you see someone's name like, oh, this person has this last name, so you can't be this. Or you say a random joke and you n never know how it hurts someone else. Or you just you, you miss out on what the potential of what diversity can bring into a company. You hire people all over the world. And sometimes I imagine you haven't even met them, but they're not always good experiences, I imagine. But some, a lot of times they're, you know, they're also good experiences and you learn a lot about just different perspectives and different mindsets, uh, especially mm -hmm. if someone is an entrepreneur for yourself. And then the C is connecting a digital age, which is um, to say that 2015 is a digital age. And even 15 years ago, we didn't have access to do what we can do with the internet right now. I'm able to start a company out of being fired in my room for my laptop and build a media company where I imagine over 20 contributors uh, who would send publishing content to me yeah, you know, daily. And I produce. I'm able to sit on my stool here and create a YouTube video because I have my iPad just recording and then I'm publishing a YouTube. And the video can reach people in Kazakhstan, Russia, or Nigeria. And the proof of this is that when people listen to podcasts and sometimes I wake up, I have you know, essays of people saying they resonate with a story of someone I interviewed and how that led them to become happy with who they are. But that's the digital age. So if you have to learn how to connect in a digital age and not to use that to go beyond just hashtag I woke up like this, hashtag Kim Kardashian broke the internet. You know, hashtag <laughs> so I think it's those ways that you, people are always saying, how can I make an impact? But you start with yourself and your society around you. And then just by, you know, being authentic, you never know who you reach because, you know, SEO, Google, anything, anyone can reach you. So, Absolutely. It's interesting that you say that. I had a professor at business school, and as you know, I went to an international business school who wrote a book called Global Cosmopolitans, I believe. She came up with this concept of global cosmopolitanism and the idea that there are going to be people like you and I who are fluent in multiple cultures, who've lived in many countries and that the workforce needs to be able to catch up. And I think McKinsey has done a really great job. Like mm. if you come to them, you say, I speak four languages. I know the business culture of five different countries. They know what to do with you. Whereas a lot of other companies don't. And so I think a lot of TCKs, as you call them, or global cosmopolitans, as Linda Brim calls them, are stuck in this position where employers don't really know how to take advantage of them. And so fortunately for us, we've ended up in a situation where we can look into entrepreneurship, but essentially her book, and it sounds like a lot of your work is about figuring out how to maximize your difference and bring that to people's attention so you can really take advantage of it. And so the workforce can really take advantage of it. Yeah. And I completely agree with you and her. It's the also other good thing is that it actually helps in negotiations. If you think about it, 
especially for global multinational companies that might not know what to do with people that speak all these languages, that just people that have lived and understand different cultures, it's, it goes just beyond that language. They actually understand some of the nuances. So you can put them in a foreign environment and then they'll be able to like, you know, pick up on some things that, you know, someone going there without having any knowledge, prior knowledge of the country might know. And then that could actually help with your getting a better deal, not getting cheated, you know, stuff like that. And exactly. It's just a matter of harnessing that. Let me ask you this, Tayo. So you and I were fortunate enough to be raised in multicultural households and spend time living in other countries. A lot of people are not. Do you think, and from your research, do you think that people who haven't had that kind of advantage or leg up can learn to adopt the TCK or global cosmopolitan mindset? Can they kind of bring that in and learn how to be fluent and cosmopolitan like that? Absolutely. And that's the other reason, you know, I like to do the podcast and create and, and use the, you know, UIDMAC.com. It's that it's building the resource and tools where you're hearing mindsets and opinions of people from different parts of the world. It's not about you necessarily, because I, I realistic, you know, not everybody's going to travel all over the world, but it's given them my frustration with media initially. And the reason why I chose media is because media is very, very powerful and it can shape opinions a lot of times. You, you see with elections here, when the elections come, you're going to see Fox News, who is going to be pro-Republican, and you're going to see MSNBC, who's going to be pro-Democratic. And people, they're just going to say whatever the agenda of the party is. But what happened to the media that will allow people to form their opinions on that kind of stuff? So I really wanted to create a platform where you have people in multiple areas of the world that are sharing opinions and perspectives. And someone can come on the platform and say, huh, I didn't know that about that place. I'm going to keep reading this person and then I'll understand more. So, I mean, it's the same thing as learning a language. You can learn from an audiobook now. You don't have to go to that country. So the more you read and the more you hear and see other people's perspectives, it all starts to shape yours and opens your mind. So I really wanted to create a platform that allowed that. So I love that. And I love that your book deals with TCKs. But maybe let's talk a little bit about why someone would want to invest in that knowledge, why they would want to become fluent in other cultures. What is it that people stand to gain, do you think? Well, I think what people stand to gain is an open mind and a fresh respect. I keep coming back to this empathy and, and all that. But I honestly feel like the best ways to build the next set of global leaders is knowing how to communicate across cultures. Because in my country, you might be familiar with concepts like this. In Nigeria, for example, we have an Islamic North and a Christian South, and we have over we have several cultures. It's so diverse. It's one of the most populous countries in the world. You know, what happens is when you know Africa was formed, it was you know basically carved up by Europeans, right? And then it just gave territories based on you know, resources that they felt like they wanted to do. And a lot of cultures were put together that wouldn't necessarily have existed before. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, these cultures have still kept some animosity. So you have some tribalism and you have some mindsets. But not understanding how to communicate those cultures doesn't help in anything because all these people, unfortunately, grew up with the same mindsets. And I've seen, for example, a book around my country, you can see some suicide bombers who were like, oh, we want to have you think this way only and that's the only way it should be. Mm -hmm. very detrimental. If you don't learn how to communicate across cultures, you will never understand what to do with another person and you just keep growing up and perpetuating certain stereotypes. Right. And I don't know if it's, I mean, you hear, I have you know, I'm, I don't pretend to be an expert in this, way, but you, in Israel and Palestine, you see stuff similar where people are like, no way, I don't want to talk about this. I can't listen, blah, 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 blah. I have no idea. You, you can probably speak to that more than I can. But it's just like, it's in every area. And if you don't learn how to do this, it's going to be a big, big problem when it's our turn to take the mantle and deal with leadership across everything, whether it's diplomacy or any of that, because we don't understand what they're coming from. So, yeah, that's absolutely right. And the other thing is, I think that there is, at least from my time at INSEAD, I've observed that there is this sort of culture of no culture, as we call it in INSEAD, where there's a global culture emerging that allows people from Germany to work with people from Russia and so on and so forth. And the more fluent you are with that culture, the more you can walk into some of the most powerful companies and organizations in the world. I mean, it's the same culture that's forming in the UN right now. It's the same culture at the McKinsey branches all over the world. And, you know, it's a culture to learn just like people learn American culture through movies. I mean, there's a language and there's a behavior around that culture. And it's really a powerful asset to have. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look at this. We don't look alike, but we were able to connect, right? We did an interview we do another interview and you know, I've been promoting your book, but we haven't even met physically. Yeah. We connected. 
And I appreciate it, by the way. <laughs> yeah, likewise. But if we had let something different about us say, oh, I don't even know that guy, whatever. You never know. You, we wouldn't be able to collaborate or even realize that we actually have more in common. Right. This is an interesting thing than any, anybody else because it's at the core of who we all are. Everybody seems to forget that we're all people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And increasingly, we all have the same interests and motives. You know, if you cut a lot of stuff like religion and nationalism out, I think a lot of people increasingly want the same things. Exactly. Whenever I say use your difference to make a difference is that we don't have to be like everybody else. But, you know, there's beauty in the mindset of a nomad one. And there's also beauty in the way that in the things that we can create together and the things we can build. Yeah, absolutely. So let's break that down a little bit. I mean, user difference to make a difference is obviously a very catchy catchphrase, but I'm interested to hear, you know, how it plays out on your show. I know how our episode went, but what are some differences and, and how are people using them? What are some of the powerful stories that you've heard? Oh, uh, well, wow. That's, <laughs> ah, you threw me on a spot there. I got to think, ah, uh, powerful stories. The way it plays out, whenever I ask someone, I, I love asking Sometimes I don't tell them beforehand because I want it to be very real. And not that's not going to be real if they say that. I want to hear what the first thing that comes to mind is. And I've heard everything from, you know, building their nonprofit or actually some people said that by actually following their passion. And that's mm-hmm. very key to me because on the surface, it seems simple. Follow your passion. But not many people do that. I'm sure you're familiar with this. We both completed an MBA. The typical road after that is to get into consulting or do something else. Yep. And like, ah, some of it. But then maybe if a year is down the line, you, or when you talk to them, you hear that they're making this ridiculous amount of money, but they're like, Ugh, I hate my job. Yeah. I really wanted to do this, but you're not. You, you know, that is a difference, for example. Being brave enough to follow your passion. Oh, yeah. Another difference, yeah. Another difference is some people, I've had people that, work in human rights or some people to just say it's just by being a good father. So I'm given all this range to say that when I'm saying make a difference, I don't mean you should go out and be like the savior, or even though both of us identify with superhero synonyms. I mean, I like to call myself the Africa Superman, but you know, that's, <laughs> that's cause you know, I'm a little nerd and whatever, but we'll get into that. But I don't want it to be like, Oh, well I can't make an impact. I can't solve yeah. sex slave or that. But I think it's, Making a difference starts with you and your community. And from there, it can go on to bigger things. It doesn't have to be something that's going to be covered on CNN. It's helping one person. And that's fine. I love that. In fact, I was at a TEDx IDC, which is a local university here. And they had a you know a TEDx independently held TED event. And there was this woman who was injured in the military at age 19, you know, couldn't walk anymore. She went into swimming incredible story. She ended up bringing home three Paralympic medals in the Paralympic Games Mm -hmm. and just inspired the entire country with her story. I mean, can't move her legs. Decided she was going to swim across the English Channel, you know, using her difference to make a difference, this disability, and discovers along the way that Pilates actually enables her to use core strength. And one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life, she's standing on stage. She goes, along about the way, I figured out that I had so much strength in my abdominal muscles that I can do this. And she just gets up out of the chair and she uses her ab muscles to lift her left leg like two millimeters off the ground and kind of thrust it forward. And then she does it again with her right. And she's walking. She has no feeling in her legs, no control of her legs. And she says, you know, my Pilates trainer calls me the world's first hover human. And like, holy crap, like this woman is walking and she's paralyzed. And so now she talks about, she has a studio here in Israel doing Pilates. She has 50 students over the last two years. 12 of them have learned to walk. See, Like you want to talk about a difference and making a difference. Like that's, see, that's exactly the powerful, that's a perfect example right there where someone did, you said, you know, I'm paralyzed, but I'm going to go do this anyway. And then along the way, she discovered something phenomenal about herself. And that's exactly the true path of what using difference can make differences. It's if you dare to be who you are, It's amazing what can happen. I mean, when I was reading your bio, I remember even chuckling in the the intro. You listened to the episode because I was like, it's this guy. (laughs) Look at this stuff. Because I had written it down, I prepared it. And then as I was reading it, it kept growing on to one. I was like, what? This this is so amazing. But you, the stuff you're doing is, it's like one thing led to another, to another, to another, to another. You discovered you you could learn this faster. You could do this faster. You have this passion for this. You're in fitness. You know all that. 
but you started with something. Oh, yeah. Well, I, my favorite quote from our episode together was, you know, you don't decide you're going to start a company teaching people how to become superhuman if you uh, fit in well in high school. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. That's not the trajectory. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just like uh, all, all the misfits, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. Tyler, let me ask you this. In a recent episode, we had Mitch Matthews, who's a really big, uh, you know, motivational speaker and coaching people to discover their dreams and rediscover their buried dreams that they're kind of too afraid to talk about or think about. And a lot of what we talked about is that those dreams are buried and they're not apparent. Do you think it's the same with discovering our difference? Do you think there's a process where we have to really look in the mirror and say, well, holy crap, I can do this and other people can't? Yeah, there's something that happens when we're kids. You know, when we're kids, we are unashamed. We are the bravest things. This is everybody. Everyone was our kids. I didn't want to do this, but a lot of kids I hear one of the astronauts, for example, right? And then if you really break that down, a lot of them, you know, I want to be this, I want to be that. And when you ask your five year old self what you wanted to be, it's this you had this big, hairy, audacious goal of being great and phenomenal. You might have watched a cartoon or a movie and you said, I want to be like that. But oh, yeah. then something happens is we start to grow up. You hear your parents say, it's not this way. Or you hear other friends say, it's not, as, you know, you can't do that. You're not this, you're too that. And then you allow this thing called reality. I'm putting the air quotes here. <laughs> reality. Quote, or, unquote, reality. Yeah. yeah, or setting and you're like, yeah, you know what, you're right. And then it's, it's unbelievable. And all of a sudden you start becoming realistic. And then that limits you from being extraordinary. And a lot of people do this all the time. And this is how they stifle what's different about them. Because if you harness that energy when you're a kid, where you were brave and said, I wanted to do what I wanted to do because you something in some TV show connected with you or something you read connected with you, that's the journey that you need to keep going on to. Because you know, one of my favorite books, The Alchemist, right? Talking about you finding your personal legend. This guy walks across, does this whole pilgrimage, starts out as a shepherd, finds out, you know, his journey in the end. But he just kept going <laughs> and going yeah, yeah. from a different country. And then he figured out a lot more about himself than he even thought. But that was because he wanted to get out of his village and not be like everybody else. It's in that area where you, I'm not saying you should, everybody should feel like they can fly and then jump off a cliff. <laughs> Disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying you need to be able to just remember that you have something in you and there's a reason why you had all those dreams, but you also have the next step is to actually take into action. You don't have to do it as a full time. It could be a side gig. You could start a simple blog and just keep journal writing whatever you want or make observations or just build certain skill sets like memorizing, learn how to read faster. <laughs> if you tell someone that 20 years ago, I'm, I'm speed reading and then I'm going to do that, that's going to be something that's going to be a revenue generator. I mean, I, I don't know how... Someone would have thought building a you know business online like you would, would have done. I mean, now you can have courses. Now you can license someone else's thing. And it's totally we're moving in the direction. And I've talked about this publicly before where, you know, we have so much access to markets that there's a market out there for everything and everyone. I mean, I have a friend who has a startup and what they do is they help wean children off feeding tubes. It turns out that some extremely small, like 0.05% of babies have this issue if they're born prematurely and they have to be fed through a tube. Well, it turns out you don't learn how to use your swallowing functionality. And there are a very, very small number. We're talking in the thousands of people walking around in this world who have to be fed through a tube because they've never learned how to eat and they don't know what it feels like to get hungry. I mean, just infinitesimally small market. But this guy has a startup. It's it's a family business. It turns out his his uh, folks are two of the foremost experts in this. And he's built a tech startup around this online learning community See? and online support community. And they do very well. And they help thousands of people who can't lead normal lives. Like, wow, you know, you don't have to shoot for the clean energy opportunity or the biofuels opportunity. If you have a specialization, and I think this is your message, if you have a difference, you happen to be a doctor who's taken one more case than the norm of feeding tubes, you can use that and you can really make a difference and make a living. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, that's exactly right. I remember when I <laughs> I couldn't even think, I didn't know how to create an idea. I wanted to be an entrepreneur, I didn't know how to create a business. And then Third Call to Kids was something I just read about on BuzzFeed. It was like, 
20 something signs you're a third culture kid you know you think in five different time zones someone asking you where you're from is the worst question you've ever <laughs> and i was like okay oh that hits close to home <laughs> you know, stuff like that it was you know how buzzfeed is they'll go for you know several things that are very funny and they have the, the gifs there so it was that i remember i never thought that that would be anything i just remember reading that and then i don't know six months later i'm at area of the conference I'm like that reminds me of that I want to reach out to that audience. I am that person. Yeah. I don't know what business is going to come out of it. I just said I'm going to create a community of people. And it's funny what happens when you have a community of people. They feel like you have a tribe and then like, you know, they belong somewhere. You start to build trust and then they, you know, they tend to see you as an authority. And it's crazy how what can happen. And all of a sudden the business can come out of building the media company. And you're telling me, you're telling me it's like, <laughs> I always say I have 30,000 of the best human beings on the planet taking my courses because, you know, they tell me what's missing, what I need to add, what I need to do. I mean, all I have to do is listen to them really to be successful. And it's just incredible the power of building a community around your product or service. Right. Exactly. I love it. Tayo, do you think there's any if, say we have someone listening and they're wondering, you know, maybe I have this difference. Maybe this is a difference. Maybe this isn't. Do you think that there's any recommended path where they can go about verifying if this is really a difference that's worthwhile to pursue? Wow, that's a good question. Is it like the idea that, you know, it just resonated with you and you just felt drawn to that community of TCKs? I think I, I would go with the latter, but I think I just resonated with that. But the thing is, this for interesting thing, I saw validation initially. I was trying to find validation. And then I remember a few people was telling me this wasn't going to work. And I didn't get discouraged because obviously I just come from being fired. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you nothing to lose. Nothing you say is going to break me down. That's what I was saying. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I remember such a tough question because sometimes you do need to find validation for a market. Because if you're going to build something as big as, I don't know, a software company for something, then, you know, it could fail or whatever. If you, there's no actual market for this. But I also think there's some point where you need to be able to trust yourself enough to just continue. This is not like been a hard, I mean, just finding a business model for me was probably the hardest thing because I knew I was passionate about something. I knew I had a community of people, but you know, the business model was like, well, how am I going to make the money? How am I going to do this? But I had to keep learning how to stick through this and making some mistakes in order to see what worked and didn't work. So I encourage people to have mentors all the time. I do myself. Oh, yeah. But I also encourage people to be able to follow their gut. And that's something that one would learn from interacting with people and surrounding yourself with the right sort of people. Oh, yeah. With the right sort of people, you're going to be able to eventually decipher which is best <laughs> when to follow your gut and when not to. Oh, yeah. Hey, I mean, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with, exactly. without a doubt. And it almost sounds like a lot of what you do is very similar to kind of the lean principles of like, I just had to get out there, I had to validate. I had to try things. I had to have conversations mm -hmm. with people in this community. I mean, are you a big advocate of lean startup, customer development, that kind of stuff? Yeah, no, absolutely. I am. I love it. I'm still, frankly, not where I need to be with a lean startup. I'm learning as much, but I love a lot of the principles that, you know. Oh, yeah. It's Reese has and all them. But yeah, it's incredible stuff. I mean, I give a lecture on failure and entrepreneurship. I gave it a couple of days ago to a group of Koreans. And basically, I don't know how, but they hadn't heard of it. And they go, uh, you know, what is this uh, lean startup thing you're talking about? I'm like, honestly, it's a coordinated, systematic methodology for using failure productively and doing failure quickly in order to learn. That's it. Like, yeah. just, you're going to fail when you try new things, when you try bold things. You know, when you try to create a podcast, reaching out to a group of people who've maybe never been brought together, these TCKs. Exactly. Right. You're going to fail. Do it quick. Do it productive. Learn a lot and then move on. Yeah, I know. A lot of my failure stories are hilarious. I mean, I have a failure book that I used to keep. I still have it. I remember from undergrad because I got rejected, I don't know, a close to, uh, I can't remember the number, but close to 100 times before I got my first job. And then even when I was getting my MBA, I got rejected, I think, five times. Amazing. So I just kept it. Yeah, I was like, okay. That'd be a cool book, actually, or a, even a cool podcast, like to get together a bunch of people who have yeah. made good and we all just bitch about our failures, you know. Oh, well, you know. Togo's rejected me and they told me I wasn't Togo's material. Like that's my favorite failure story. Let's do it. <laughs> Personally. Yeah, we should get on it. I love it, yeah. What else are you working on right now? Well, yeah, right now I think it's like you. I'm starting to hit the speaking circuit. I'm getting into more conferences and stuff like that, but I'm also working on a course as well, like you are. I'm trying to build 
this uh, a platform for where I, I produce courses that cross-cultural experts talk about certain things that we are related to. So it could be international students, or it could be cross-cultural people in the workplace, or even people traveling outside of the United States, stuff like that. So that's I'm beautiful. Working on that kind of stuff now. That's awesome. I got to connect you with some INSEAD folks because you know that's what we are all about. Well, that would be great. I would love to do that. Awesome. So, Taya, one more question. If our audience takes away only one message today and carries it with them for the rest of their lives, what do you think that message should be? It boils down to this quote from Confucius, and it says, he who says he can and he who says he can't are both usually right. Oh, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful one to end on. Taya, where can people get in touch with you? Where should we send them and uh, get them linked up to awesome stuff you're doing? Twitter. Nah, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm easily accessible anywhere. So at Tyroxin, T-A-Y-O-R-O-C-K-S-O-N. You can get me there or Tyroxin at UIDMag.com. But you, know, you can just tweet me. At- Rock on. And everything's on the UID website, yeah? UIDMag.com. Yep. My personal website is Tyroxin.com. So it's... Perfect. We will link all that stuff up in the show notes. I'll also put a link to the, the episode we did on your show. As I said, you were awesome, awesome interviewer. Thank you. So are you. Well, thank you, Ken. This is off the cuff. You did it, killed it. No, like no mistakes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I woke up like ten minutes before this, so I'm pretty happy with how it went. <laughs> you woke up ten minutes before this. I woke up ten minutes before our call. I was like, oh, beautiful, God. dude. The power nap, man. It's all yeah. about the power nap. Yeah, it is. It is awesome. Well, Tayo, you have a great afternoon, evening, morning. I'm not exactly sure what. Well, it's morning, but it's almost afternoon. <laughs> have a good morning as well, my friend. <laughs> All right, let's keep in touch. All right, no problem. Take care. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.